Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, formal meeting or the sixth meeting in 2019 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I please ask you to make sure all your mobile phones are on silent? And uh, we'd move on to agenda item three, which is the restricted roads, 20 mile an hour speed limit bill, Scotland. This is our second evidence session on the restricted roads bill, and the committee will take evidence from motoring and road and passenger organisations. I'd like to welcome Neil Gregg, the Policy and Research Director of I Am Road Smart, Paul White, the Deputy Director Scotland of the Confederation of Passenger Transport Scotland, Tony Ken Muir, the Chairman of the Scottish Taxi Federation, Martin Reid, the Policy Director uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland Road Haulage Association, and Eric Bridgestock, the independent road safety researcher on behalf of the Alliance of British uh, Drivers. Could I say to those of you that haven't given evidence before, um, the way this works is because there's quite a lot of you, um, there are a series of questions which members would like to ask you. If you'd like to come in, try and catch my eye, um, I'm afraid I won't necessarily get in on every single question, but I'll do my utmost to do that. Uh, don't touch any of the buttons in front of you. They'll all be operated by the gentleman on your left. And uh, the other thing I would say is uh, just keep your eye on me once you start talking because sometimes uh, when you get passionately involved in the subject, you may wander on for a bit. And if you see my wagging my pen like this, it probably means that you, you ought to be coming to the end because it, it can fly out of my hand to attract your attention if, if, you're, if you're not paying attention. Um, but, but hopefully you'll all get a chance to, to come in. Stuart, before we go any further, you'd like to make a declaration, I believe. Um, yes, I draw attention to my register of interest, which shows I'm a member of the IAM. OK, thank you. Does anyone else want to make a declaration? No. OK, we'll move on to the first question, which is from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Good morning, panel. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we have had some of your written evidence, um, but I want to start out by, if you could briefly outline whether you support the move from uh, 30 to 20 on restricted roads, and if you could give us the reasoning behind your answer. That looks like it's a question to all of you. So, Neil, do, do you want to start off? Uh, br briefly, uh, we don't support the, the bill because of the blanket nature of its intention to change everything in a, in a sort of unfocused way. We are not against 20 mile an hour when it's required. It's very popular outside schools. Uh, we did a survey of uh, several thousand drivers a few years ago, and what that came out with was that 49% didn't think they did, we couldn't support uh, 20 becoming the new 30. Uh, 21% could support it, and there was a big chunk in the middle, about 20%, who said, um, we don't know yet. So there's not a huge anti-20 mile an hour amongst drivers, there's a survey of drivers, but our issue is that we just think it's a too broad brush. If you have an issue with a street, if you want to change behaviour, you have to change the look and feel of the street. Uh, the evidence is quite clear from the Park Transport, other studies. If you just put up the signs, and you know, perhaps Edinburgh is an example of that, it doesn't have a huge impact on behaviour. And there's a number of studies that have come out recently from Atkins down south, all saying basically the same thing, 20 mile an hour without changing the character of the road doesn't really change driver behaviour. So it's that blanket approach. We'd rather see it targeted. Paul. Cool. Uh, my membership, the membership of CPT is divided on the issue. Um, there are certain members that, um, I think they all are supportive of the aims of the bill. Um, certain ones believe that, you know, uh, if urban operators in particular, getting to 20 miles an hour is aspirational, uh, never mind 30 miles an hour, whereas um, some members are worried about the impacts on their business, particularly in marginal services, where a, 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 an increase in journey times could lead to patronage and make that service non-viable. So a bit of a mix, but we, we support the aims and... Uh, perhaps there are elements that can be changed within the, the, the supplementary guidance or the bill itself that would make it more palatable to more of my members. Tony. I'm speaking for uh, just over 23,000 public hire taxi drivers in Scotland. I haven't had a single response in favour of the bill. Um, having said that, um, they're generally supportive of 20 mil and our speed limits where it's appropriate. Uh, but I, I imagine this will be a very consistent message. But um, the feeling is that the blanket approach uh, is um, likely to cause um, a lack of compliance 
um, there's a, a likelihood of increased compliance <coughs> if it's um, applied specifically where required. Martin. Very similar to um, my colleagues along here. Um, our, 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 the response of our members uh, has been along the lines of an objection to the blanket approach. Nobody in principle has a problem with 20 mile an hour speed limits. Um, should they be protecting the vulnerable or in areas where there are known hotspots and problem areas? Um, but again, it's a blanket nature that people find unpalatable rather than the, 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 the issue of the 20 miles an hour itself. Eric. Uh, yeah, just to be clear, I'm here because the ABD uh, hasn't got anybody that could um, be here today. Um, I'm an independent, uh, but they asked me, uh, contacted me last week uh, on the basis that they knew I've done some work on this in the past. Uh, and they nor, nor I uh, support 20 mile an hour generally mm -hmm. on the basis that there's no evidence at all that it makes anything safer uh, from a casualty point of view and collisions. Uh, it doesn't, uh, in fact, it makes things worse for the reason that people are lulled into a false sense of security on the road if they're walking or whatever. Um, and there's lots of other reasons we're going to later, I'm sure. So okay. do not support. Stuart, you wanted to come in briefly. Um, I've just heard almost every witness use the term blanket nature of the ban. Um, in fact, the bill says restricted roads. In other words, it does not apply to anything that's an A road. It does not apply to anything that's a B road. It therefore is applying essentially to the housing estates and the side roads off main roads. And I just wondered whether, in making the comments blanket road, we were actually talking about what the bill is saying, or a more general objection to, in all urban areas, a universal 20 mile an hour limit. I just wanted to be clear, because in particular the IM who did a survey, you know, was it in the context of the limited objective of this bill or was it in the context of really basically all roads in urban areas? It was in the context of all roads in urban areas. So the question was framed, uh, do you disagree or agree with the current 30 limit being replaced by a 20 limit? Right. Uh, yeah. uh, Mark, do you want to come in briefly and then I'll go back to Actually, you? I think Stuart's slightly misdirecting you. It's not uh, on urban roads, just okay. it's on all our villages in, in our country areas as well. So a 30 mile an hour road through a village isn't affected, but every single road and lane off that, that are restricted. Uh, so it's not just urban, it's rural as well. Okay. Um, Gail, do you want to come back with me? Yeah, them? absolutely. So, yeah, the, the, the point was made, it's correct, that the bill only applies to restricted roads. You, um, as you know, some local authorities already do, as some of you mentioned, have it outside schools and in certain housing estates and things like that. Um, it was also mentioned last week about having variable speed limits at different times of the day. Do you think that's possible or do you think that's just confusing? Who'd like to head off on that? Paul. Uh, I'll answer that if that's okay because of the experience we've had with bus lanes. Uh, I think that if you vary speeds, you, you muddy the waters. If you vary in, in times and it really, and um, we've lobbied in Edinburgh for, uh, you know, um, set times that are, you know, seven days a week, 7-7 seven, seven or whatever, you know, something that's set that you can know um, and that helps, I think, if we're looking for a, a mindset change, you really need to make it as easy as possible to comply and I, I worry that if you were to set different timings that, that you would maybe just add to the confusion and a lack of um, compliance. Tony, do you want to come in on that? Yes, <coughs> I think that uh, a 247365 <coughs> approach is possibly more of an issue for us uh, because we've got so many taxi drivers crisscrossing uh, the nation at all times of the day and the night. Um, and um, you know, driving at 20 miles an hour on a dual carriageway when there isn't another vehicle in sight, a mile in front or a mile behind, it doesn't make any sense to anybody. <coughs> um, so um, we're very much in favour of, uh, of a timed approach. Although I'm inclined to agree when it comes to bus lanes. Um, Nobody uses them any time because the idea of the clock's changed and everybody moves into the left doesn't happen. It's never likely to. Uh, but I think the signage that's in the RAC report that you've got, um, I, you know, that looks very practical to me and I think that's a much better solution than a 247365 approach to 20 miles an hour. Neil, you would stay in. I think we can get hung up on fixed speed limits. I think other parts of Europe do use variable speed limits. In France, for example, they vary the speed limit with the weather. I think the issue for us is the road should be self-explaining. If you're having to put extra technology in to explain 
why that limit is there, then you've kind of lost the you've, you've lost the, the narrative. It should be clear to people why they should be doing that speed at that time because there's pedestrians there because of uh, the, the nature of the road. So again, it comes back to this concept of if you don't change the road, the character of the road, you are going to have an issue. Um, convincing people what the speed limit is. It should be a self-explaining. And technology would be very expensive as well. <clears throat> Eric, you want to come in? Just to say that I think that drivers need to be told what the hazards are, whether a school is operating and so on. I don't think they need to be told what speed to go. Uh, and I say I've seen no evidence at all that 20 is actually a, a positive thing. I think it actually makes things worse from a, a safety point of view. So signs that come on to say, beware there's a school here, or signs that go up to say that... The, there's a school or a hospital or whatever it is, um, but changing the speed limit, I think, is uh, a negative. Okay, go. Okay, yeah, I, I think other people are going to um, go on to the, the safety aspect. Just to continue this line, um, the way things are at the moment, uh, local authorities have the power to um, issue a traffic order to turn a 30 into a 20. Do you think an alternative approach might be to streamline that system and make it easier for them to do it in the current situation that we're in just now? Um, one of the concerns that we have um, with a TRO system and, and uh, even in its current form is the fact that local authorities across the board are facing real shortages uh, in terms of resource. And to add something like this onto already troubled waters, um, the, there's a concern that uh, firstly, they, they, they could potentially take the easiest option because of resource constraints, and which would be just doing that, as we said, the, the blanket approach, rather than looking at individual roads. Um, so I guess that, that would be a concern. Um, anything that, that, that could be done to mitigate that, I guess, would be, would be very welcome, but I know that that would probably be done in the next stage of, of the bill and when more detail is, is forthcoming on that. But putting it under the blanket of just the TRO system just now as it currently exists, we would have concerns about the, the local authority's ability to carry that out. Mm -hmm. But if they've got the ability to carry it out at the moment, surely making the process easier and quicker would be good for local authorities because it would take less time and resource. It does that, but why, would, why, why would it be quicker by changing it when they've already got the established system? Okay. I, th I think the point the deputy convener is making is, is it's quite laborious to go through the process to get to get a 20 mile an hour reduction. And the question was that if they had uh, uh, just to, to if if it was quicker and easier to do, it would make the requirement for a blanket 20 mile an hour ban <coughs> superfluous because you could actually target the areas in question. Uh, to, to, Tony, do you want to come back on that? Do you, would you agree with that or? It, it seems logical. Um, I'm not clear on Sorry. what the alternative to the TRO process would be, uh, but surely uh, that seems logical to me. Okay. Jamie, I think the next question is yours. Yes, uh, thank you. But just to follow on from before I do on this TRO thing, it's an important issue. If the current system means you have to uh, apply for a TRO to reduce a road to 20, presumably the same would be true in the obverse if it was 20 to then Im increase that road to a 30. Uh, do you have any views on whether there would be an additional or reduced workload to do it the other way around? Um, Paul, do you want to come in and then Neil? Uh, well, I think that just to quote back the evidence you received at your previous session, that you know the quantity of roads that they would be looking to change to 30 would be less, less so just in the percentages of, of workloads, that would be the answer. I think that in, in terms of TRO, I, can, I would support streamlining as long as it doesn't affect any kind of uh, consultation that you have with the key stakeholders that are impacted by the TRO. Um, <clears throat> but I think that would be an important that if, if we were to introduce the bill that before it was um, applied on the roads, there was a period of time where you consulted with stakeholders, like such as the people in this panel, to decide which roads should perhaps be retain the 30 mile per hour status and have those TROs in place before the 20 mile an hour zone was, was, was applied. Neil. It was just that the, the feedback I'm getting from local authorities, it's, it's the cumulative effect of everything that's happening at the moment is, is causing them a resource issue. So pavement parking, low emission zones, this, this bill, it all came together at the same time. That's why they would struggle. But certainly if it did go through, we would, we would like to see a streamlined process so it is easier to do it and, and because they have all these other things to do as well, as well as fixing the potholes and the little things they should be doing day to day. Indeed, presumably there would need to be some mapping exercise to work out which roads it wanted to change to the contrary. Um, there are many uh, reasons have been given 
um, for the rationale behind the bill. And if I could ask, in your response to my question, not to focus on those of air quality, journey times and congestions, because my colleagues will have other questions. I'm going to focus specifically on perhaps what is at the nib of this, and that's the road safety aspect. Um, what, is the, what are the panel's views on uh, this reduction from 30 to 20 miles per hour uh, and the effect it has on road safety and all road users, both vulnerable users, drivers and others who use roads, including cyclists, pedestrians, etc.? Who'd like to, Eric, you want to go with that? Um, I have just thought on that. Um, I hinted earlier that the, that the whole thrust of the 20 mile an hour approach is to encourage people to feel safer, um, whether they're walking or cycling or whatever. Um, less so for drivers. Drivers just have to make sure they're looking at their speed over to make sure they're down to about 20 miles an hour. Although the evidence then is that the speeds actually don't change very much. They talk about minus one miles an hour. Um, so the more you encourage people to feel safer, the less care they take, and it's evidence in any 20 mile an hour zone that I've driven through, certainly St Albans where I live, uh, people wander across the road, there are pelican crossings, but they wander into the road without even looking, um, because they're encouraged to feel safer. And the evidence seems to be um, that the casualties go up. Uh, Manchester have just, what, last two years ago, uh, cancelled their next stage of 20 mile an hour rollout because the casualty reductions in the 20 mile an hour zones were less than those in the remaining 30 mile an hour zones. Uh, Bridgestock, do you have a view on what percentage of uh, accidents or collisions are caused by excessive speed? Do you have any statistics on that? Excess, what do you mean by excessive speed? Uh, above the speed limit. Uh, I don't have an, an answer to that, no. Okay, uh, it would be helpful. I, okay, I, I would point out that speed above the speed limit cannot in itself cause anything. I think I hinted in my, my paper that if you change the speed limit, you do not automatically make the road less or more safe whether you make it a faster speed limit or a slower speed limit. So, so in other words, what, what's your view on what, what is a safe speed? What, uh, you know, is it, is it a, a, an arbitrary number that government dictates to drivers or is there some other form that you think is a better method? Safe speed is whatever is appropriate to the conditions. Right. Safe speed on a motorway in the fog might be 30 miles an hour, even though the speed limit is 70. Safe, safe speed in a 20 mile an hour zone could be, well, it was, since it was previously 30, presumably it was 30 then. Jamie, I'm just going to bring in Stuart, and I'll come back to you, if I may, Stuart. Um, I just want to pursue what Mr Brigstad said. He's essentially suggesting that if we make people feel safer, they will act more recklessly. That argument I first heard in the 1960s, when uh, proposals to compulsorily fit seatbelts to cars were introduced. Is there any evidence that the fitting of seatbelts to cars, which I think it's generally acknowledged, made everyone feel safer, led to an increase in accidents and reckless or careless driving? Eric, I think that's back to you. I can say that. <laughs> I'm not sure of the evidence, but I'm certainly aware of the arguments. Um, there's certainly an argument that says if you put a spike in the middle of the steering wheel, everybody would drive a lot safer because that's a very clear evidence that they're going to be hurt in the event of a, an incident. Um, so, yeah, but I think... Do you forgive me, Mr Brigstock? Yeah. You can't simply turn the argument upside down to suit your own purposes, I'm with not. which I fundamentally disagree, I hasten to add. Um, I'm simply asking the very simple question that the most important innovation and contribution to safety, I would argue, and others do, um, to, to preventing injury and death on our roads is the introduction of seatbelts on a compulsory basis. That made everybody feel safer. I'm simply asking <coughs> that major initiative to make people feel safer, did that cause people, when they felt safer, to be more reckless in the way they drove? I suspect in some cases that is the case. Ah, you suspect in some cases, but you adduce and bring to us no evidence of any kind whatsoever to sustain your argument that making people feel safer makes them more reckless. I'll leave it there, convenient. Uh, I, I think... I th can I th come back uh, uh, Eric, you can come back, and then I want to go back to Jamie. OK, just say, I started driving when seatbelts were just being made compulsory, so I've, I've always driven with a seatbelt, except when I hired an MGA in Scotland in 2012, no seatbelts, uh, no power steering, no anything. Uh, I felt very unsafe for the first few miles um, driving with no seatbelt on. Uh, I was very careful, but it's an old car anyway. So, 
Um, Jamie, back to you. With, with respect to Ms. Stevenson, we're not taking evidence on whether seat belts are good or bad. Um, we're taking evidence on whether a reduction to 20 mile per hour or not will improve road safety. So can I ask, the, therefore, the panel, do they have any views on whether this approach, the approach that's specified in the bill, will have an effect on road safety, including drivers' perceptions, if that's the case? Neil, do you want to come in on that? The evidence is growing all the time, but the difference is very small. It's not making much difference in terms of safety because these roads were often safe before. So you're not seeing a huge increase in safety. And if you wanted to change the number of people killed in our roads, you would target rural roads, for example. Very few people get killed as pedestrians and cyclists in our, in our towns and cities. Some do, and that's clearly to be avoided. Um, so if you look at all this, the, the Atkins study we've talked about, all the other studies, it's very difficult to pick out any real safety benefits. So that's the key thing you're looking for. Uh, also, the, the studies are now showing that the reductions in speed are, they are there, one or two miles per hour, coming down a little bit, often imperceptible, often unnoticed by the locals. Um, and there's a recent speed compliance survey in, um, from the Department of Transport, and that sh showed that 81% of people in 20-mile-an-hour 20 zones were breaking the speed limit. They were travelling above 20 miles an hour. There's a huge compliance issue in 20 mile an hour zones. So it's, it's, I think we do need more research, we do need more evidence, but there's a growing body of evidence that they're just not having the impact on road safety that they're having. And unfortunately, they're not having the impact on the other things like active travel encouragement as well. But from a road safety perspective, we don't really see it as being a huge improvement. It's not making much difference because many of these roads were safe before. Paul, you wanted to come back. <laughs> um, well, I, to put it in, its, in very simple terms, getting hit by a bus or a car at 20 miles an hour is less damaging than being hit by one by th at 30. You know, breaking distances are less. I mean, and these are this is the early stages. I t completely agree. Your, the evidence is either inconclusive or points to not a huge reduction. But I guess at, at this stage, what we're looking at are schemes that haven't been in operation that long. And if you're looking at attitudinal change down the line, perhaps speeds will come closer to 20, ideally below 20, and, and then you would hopefully see the safety benefits. But at the moment, the evidence is inconclusive. Sorry. Uh, yeah. No, no, finish yours. Yeah, yeah we'll I mean, it, it, they may complement each other in, in one respect. I mean, I, I'm very keen that, that we, as a committee, uh, look at this um, subjectively as we can and uh, use an evidence-based approach to what's happened. Now, we wouldn't be the first place in the world to do this. Scotland... Uh, uh, it wouldn't be, uh, it's been done in other cities in the UK, other parts of the UK. We've been doing it in Edinburgh for uh, a reasonable amount of time. Is the committee aware of any evidence to suggest that accident levels have gone up or gone down, that safety has improved or decreased based on what's already happened? This is not a new concept. So surely we could use the evidence that we already have to help inform our, our decision moving forward. Who, who'd like to go on that? Neil, you're offering. The evidence is inconclusive. That's, that's the problem. <laughs> if, if it was clear, then we would throw a weight behind it, but it's just inconclusive. And we're getting a growing number of studies from across you know, Portsmouth, uh, Manchester, uh, parts of London, Edinburgh, of course. Still got to see the real long-term benefits from, from, from Edinburgh. Uh, lots of studies being done. Research is just coming up with the same thing time and time again. The, roads, the safety benefits are pretty inconclusive. <clears throat> to come in with a question on safety. Uh, thank you, Convener. It, it's building on what my um, colleague, uh, Jamie Green, has, has asked, and just to tease out some more issues around the safety um, area, which is obviously very important um, uh, wherever this goes. Um, my understanding from the um, Atkins report is it does not come to any um, substantial conclusions, and this has been highlighted that, that you know, perhaps it's early days in, in, in many ways, but it is clear from the evidence it presents that, as I understand it, that the wider 20-mile-an-hour um, rollout, the higher the reduction in casualties, and it's been seen in the Brighton case study, which is the only area case study which is featured in the, in the report, which has the highest change in collisions and casualties. Now, there is um, a national inconsistency across Scotland in regard to 20 mile an hour rollouts. Most of your organisations, as I understand it, and from the written evidence and from today, say that 20 miles an hour is appropriate in the right places. Why then do the people of the borders, which is in my region, for instance, um, not deserve safer streets when we have them here in Edinburgh already? Uh, head off on that quite lengthy question. Preface it with the report, <laughs> convenient. Who'd like to go? Tony, do you, do you want to have a go at sure. that? Sure. Um, 
I, I don't claim to be a, a, an expert in road safety. I'm an expert in the, just the practicalities of shifting people around from one place to another. However, um, I was very closely involved in the consultation in Edinburgh, um, and um, we monitored very closely um, what happened in the 16 test areas that we had around the city. And I think that the reason that um, evidence of a change in road safety is inconclusive is that there's very little change in driver behaviour and the speed that they're moving at um, in the first place. So in a couple of the areas that were restricted in Edinburgh, average speed went up a little bit, and some of them it went down a little bit. The overall effect was to change the speed of the traffic from 21 and a half miles an hour to 20 and a half um, miles an hour. So the actual speed at which traffic's moving, I know that an average taxi moves at about 13 miles an hour in the course of a 12 hour shift. So uh, I don't think anybody would deny the people of the borders safe streets. Um, I think um, we're just talking about the practicalities of the fact that um, in the streets around a school, uh, when there are lots of parents picking up and dropping off and lots of kids moving around, people generally move quite slowly anyway. Um, and changing the speed limit from 30 to 20 when the traffic's moving around at three or four miles an hour is academic. And I think that's the issue for me across the board here, that changing the speed limit from 30 to 20 uh, and I think that would reflect the view of the views of our members as pretty much an academic exercise because mostly traffic moves um, in line with the conditions anyway. Um, um, so that would be my point of view. Very quickly back on that, that um, if you take um, an area where there's a school, once you're in that 20 mile an hour zone, you're in that 20 mile an hour zone, but there are residential streets around about where children are still crossing the road and going away from school and all that. And would, would not the 20 mile an hour um, uh, blanket um, arrangement, apart from the, the ex exemptions, just sh send that clear message that this is an appropriate speed to stick below? I, I, I think it's, um, it's a question of um, uh, the, uh, just paying some regard to the reality. And the reality is that the traffic doesn't get up to 30 miles an hour anyway. So you can make the signs whatever you want them to be. Um, and I think all the evidence shows that it isn't actually changing average speeds or driver behaviour. Is it changing people's perceptions? I, I don't know. Thank you. I think we'll move on to the next question, which I'm going to ask uh, Peter. It's yours, Peter. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, I'm going to go on a different, uh, slightly different tack. I'm going to ask you about vehicle emissions and, and, and the air quality, as a, whether it might change for the better or for the worse by a, going to a, a, a blanket 20 mile an hour. What, what do you feel? Do you feel that the, there is mixed views on whether this will make a, emissions a, better or worse? What do you feel? What do you think the impact of uh, would have on uh, restricted roads to have a... Oh, what, what impact this would have on vehicle, vehicle emissions and the air quality in our towns and cities if we go to the default 20 mile an hour? Martin, do you want to head off on that? Um, <coughs> we've had a look at this and we can't find any evidence to say that there's, there's a massive difference uh, in terms of the emissions. Um, what, what there would be would be um, a, a, a slight reduction in particulates through things like tyre wear, etc. But in terms of the emissions themselves, we, we haven't been able to find any evidence that that switch would, would make any difference or whether a truck would perform better or worse at 20 mile an hour than 30 mile an hour in terms of emissions. OK. Do you want to on that? Yes, I agree with Martin. It is, we've gone, moved from one topic where the evidence is inconclusive to another one where it, you know, it's rather inconclusive, the difference between 20, that delta between 20 to 30 miles per hour inclusive. Although you, you raise a good point about the, the, the areas where air quality is a real issue, those urban corridors are ones where, to, referring to bus, you, your, your average speed is far below 20 miles per hour. And um, <coughs> perhaps uh, if 20 mile per hour zones bring uh, a smoother flow of traffic, less acceleration, deceleration, and you can have a conversation with the council around about um, other uh, mitigating, uh, supporting measures to, to help to help uh, bus, such as priority at lights and things like that, that allows bus a smoother uh, journey, then that will bring down, bring down emissions. Mm. But, you know, I think that's a key point as well. The stop-start nature of con congestion is what causes the majority of the problems uh, in that area. So the, the free flow of traffic would be the one that would make the biggest difference rather than a 20 or 30 miles an hour speed limit in terms of emissions. Do you, do you think, do you think if, if we did go at a 20 mile an hour speed limit that that would 
allow the traffic to flow more freely? Because we have heard some evidence on motorways, for instance, if you're reducing in, in congested areas from 70 to 50, you actually, you, the, the traffic actually moves better. Would that, would that allow that to happen in, in towns as well? I don't know whether that, that could go by extension or not. Um, the, 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 the 20 mile an hour zones that, that exist just now, we understand why they're there and what reason they're there for. Uh, and so, as we say, driver behaviour changes. Um, uh, I don't know, certainly when we're looking at city centres, our, our, our members will not be in the 20 mile an hour zones as much as the rest of the, the people here's members. Mm. Um, so. I'll defer to their expertise uh, on, on that side of things. But um, for an HGV in Edinburgh city centre, there is a very strong likelihood that they'll not get to 20 mile an hour uh, on any of the roads coming mm. in. Um, Tony, do you want to come back on that? Because I think you intima intimated that the average speed was, was about 30 miles an hour. Did, did, did I get that wrong, or is that what you said? Oh, correct. Yeah. Um, the the emissions that we generate are generally caused because we're crawling around at low speed. So again, changing the average, the, the speed limit from 30 to 20 when you're stationary is academic. Um, so um, emissions would be reduced if we could all get to a cruising speed and keep it going. Um, wouldn't that be nice? I think... John, you want to come in, and then I'll come back to you, Peter, if you've got a question. Thank you, Kavina. Uh, morning, panel. Can I thank you all for your evidence um, and uh, uh, written evidence and your submissions today? Of course, what, what we're, we're seeking, um, and a number of colleagues have said this, is uh, for, the, for, for your opinions, which are valued, to have an evidence base. We're, we're not interested in erroneous or unsup opinions that are unsupported by robust search findings. So... Um, Mr. Bridgestock, you have a number of colourful phrases in your submission. Uh, the widely accepted figure, for instance, of 40,000 a year deaths attributable, directly attributable to poor air quality, you describe, I quote here, as a zombie statistic, simply not true. Um, and oh, uh, you well, if, you, if you let me finish, sure. I, I see you find it amusing. I, I don't well, find that amusing. My, the, that's not, not my quote. No, no. This is no, the no. AB. This is Brian Gregory. Yeah, it's, it's your, your, in your <laughs> hey, but I did not write did not write that piece at all. We, that came from ABD. Right, right. Yes. So you, you're speaking in support of this paper, or do, do you? I'm supporting the paper. I did. Right. That's fine. Well, it's... let me come on to the next bit then, please. Um, perhaps the most telling thing, um, because. Views are important, and not everything, I'm not suggesting everyone sits and does endless research. Views are important, but there has to be some evidence basis. And I'm trying to understand the value that we would place in your, your opinions when you say something like, and I do quote here, and for the avoidance of doubt, you attribute this to a, a transcript of a BBC Sunday politics programme, at which you say at 25 minutes, 34 seconds in, um, at some point, the phrase... Pollution levels are illegal because we made them illegal, not because it's dangerous. Your view is pollution is not dangerous. Urban pollution is not dangerous. Okay. As I say again, I did not write this part of the paper, but I'm prepared to answer the question. Um, I think it, what the, the purpose of that statement is, if you adjust the level at which you believe we should be aiming for, um, we've, it's a bit like speed limits. We, we, for a long time, we've had a 30 mile an hour speed limit, which has generally been agreed to be the right speed for years and years and years. And we're now saying we want to change it to 20. That's, that's, that's sort of saying, well, we've made it 20. If we exceed 20, we're now making that illegal, whereas two years ago, 30 was perfectly legal. And it's a similar sort of argument, I think. Um, we're specifically talking about the air quality. And, sure. Um, um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here. You, you, this is the paper you're speaking to. You're not attributing this to... Uh, 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 with a link to, to a BBC programme. Do you agree with the statement pollution levels are illegal, illegal because we made them illegal and perhaps more worrying the statement pollution levels are not dangerous? That's it. The, um, well, I think pollution levels have been getting better for years and years as well because we've been doing all manner of changes to cars or vehicles generally are cleaner. So my understanding is that pollution is improving. Is pollution dangerous? Air quality, poor air quality, dangerous? Or is that? A it is what it is, isn't it? I'm afraid. I, I can't. I'm not an expert on this. My safety is no. my okay. thing. Okay. Thank you. Pollution is that's, that's great. Thank you.
We'll move on to the next question then, which is Richard. Richard Love. Yes, I, I've got two questions, and the, the second one I'll expand on. But basically, the first question is a number of respondents to the online survey uh, raised concerns about the reduced speed limit, increasing journey times, and worsening traffic uh, congestion. Do you have a view on this? I'm sure Mr. Ken Muir has. He already has. You're basically saying that um, we're all travelling around at 13 miles an hour anyway. No, no, the truth is I, I don't believe that um, changing the speed limit would have a significant effect on journey times. I don't think it does in Edinburgh, where I have personal experience of yeah, driving is, a taxi. Is that not just a factor in Edinburgh? Well, you know, what about you know, what about Motherwell? What about uh, uh, Bell Sill? What about um, Dumfries? No. You know, <laughs> would that would that not increase? Would you know? You know your average. Um, I, I think that um, uh, my experience is that where a 20 mile an hour speed limit, let's say late at night when a road is not congested, um, uh, 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 in my experience and the feedback from our members is that nobody particularly abides by the 20 mile an hour speed limit anyway. So um, I, I tend to refer to what actually happens in the real world. And what's happening in the real world is um, that um, we're not complying with the 20 mile an hour speed limit, and therefore journey times are not being significantly um, affected and the cost of taxi journeys isn't being significantly impacted. On a, uh, on a journey of several miles where somebody driving at a consistent 20 miles an hour rather than a consistent 30 miles an hour, then it would moderately affect the overall journey time and the cost. But in the real world, I don't think that happens. No. Not enough to measure it. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, as we have had no feedback whatsoever from members to say that journey times have increased um, within 20 mile an hour zones, or indeed in, in, in most cases where speed limits have dropped. Uh, we, you can look at the A9 as an example, um, where journey times have moved slightly, um, but the driver experience has balance that out it's a, it's a, it's a better drive now uh, uh, and they tend to make uh, provision for the additional 10 15 minutes it's going to take from between Perth and uh, Inverness uh, in terms of the the, the urban argument um, I believe Fife uh, and Clack Manninshire are, are two of the areas who have adopted the 20 mile an hour uh, zone uh, or the 20 mile an hour approach uh, and again, I would reiterate, we've had no adverse feedback from members to say that journey times are longer on that. Yep. Richard. Yeah, I, I think, Paul, do you want to come in this Paul, question? Yeah. Is that okay? Um, <coughs> journey time, reliability, punctuality, all so important to um, bus operations. Uh, I have no evidence I can present to you, but uh, from the discussions with operators, they've found that the... Um, these zones have maybe increased journey times, but marginally so. Um, and, and, and so, the, in discussions with the local authority, they've been able to suggest measures that they could be they could be put into place that would mitigate that that, that small increase in journey times. Based on my second question, uh, last week when I asked the the question, there was quite a lot of comments come back on Twitter. Uh, I was asking if bus times uh, would be affected and timetables would be affected. I'm now assured. They won't. Uh, in fact, basically, the reducing to 20 would improve, uh, would still allow, uh, because they're stop starting. And Mr. Kemmure says that they're only going at 13 miles an hour anyway. So, if you let, let me come in with the second question. So, basically, in your opinion, would reducing the default speed limit on restricted roads to 20 miles per hour have any specific impact on bus operators? logistic companies and taxi operators. We got the answer to that last week. I would like your answer to that question. Since you operate taxis going at 13 miles an hour. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't believe it will have any measurable effect on journey times. Paul, you want to come first? Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to, to clarify my comments, I'm referring to um, certain operators that have experienced 20 mile per hour zones, and I wouldn't like those to be taken to say that uh, the introduction of the bill 
uh, across all restricted roads would have zero impact on all operators because that's not what I'm saying at all. And, uh, and there, is, there are certainly CPT members, particularly in rural areas, that would uh, have, have voiced concerns that there would be an impact. So uh, I don't know if those concerns will, will prove to be the case, but I just want to make, make that clear that I wasn't saying that there would be no impact. Um, and in terms of, of costs, <coughs> the, there is a potential uh, if you if there is an impact on journey times and you have to put more resource into the into retaining frequencies, then that does generate a cost. Drivers, fuel, vehicles, uh, and there's, but there's the potential that if um, the bill comes in and encourages active tra travel, uh, 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 then that maybe actually leads to an increase in bus patronage would be the, would be the hope. Um, so you know. I'm unsure what would be the impact, what would be the, the results. To come in on that, and then I'll bring Jamie in. Sure. Uh, again, I would go back to the fact that there are not that the amount of HGVs that would be in these roads in the first place would be vastly reduced. My concern would be uh, when you're looking at some of the more non-regulated uh, industries, such as the vans, uh, who are brought in to do multi-drop in a number of different areas. Uh, within that will be within those zones or within residential areas, and it would be the compliance side of that that would give me concerns. But as, as far as um, you know, uh, haulage goes, uh, like my colleague from CPT says, uh, until we know what roads are, are likely to be affected, we can't say with any degree of certainty uh, about journey times. But certainly, when you're looking at the urban uh, side of things, we, we've had no uh, no feedback from members to say that journey times have been impacted because of the nature of the roads that they're on and the understanding that they're there for a purpose, that, that speed limit. Jamie, you wanted to come in. Yes, thank you. It's following on from Mr Lowell's line of questioning. I think if you're <laughs> focusing purely on cities where perhaps average journey times are already below 30 anyway, then it's easy to see why there is a nominal effect. But if this, and we do know which roads it will apply to because it states in the bill, uh, that that approach, that experience may be different across other parts of Scotland. Now, the REC, who are not here today, to be fair to them, quoted in evidence to us that the potential impact in urban congestion from reduced speeds and longer journey times may increase emissions. It goes back to our previous line of questions. I don't think we'd ever really got to the nib of whether slower speeds increases emissions or not. Um, but do you uh, agree or disagree with the REC's comment on that? Right, Neil, you, you want to start and I'll come <clears> to you, Eric. Again, inconclusive is the word of the day, and, and it's inconclusive on emissions, it's also inconclusive on, on, on congestion. Um, we have, I have seen no real evidence to show that the journey times would change in a way that people would notice, because the, the studies so far show that the speed limit, the driver behaviour in 20 mile an hour zones, has, does reduce speeds, it particularly reduces speeds at the top end, so if it was 29, 28, it comes down 26, 27. Um, but it's so imperceptible that people just don't see any, di any difference. So if you're, if you're not seeing any difference, it's not causing any issues, then you know, people take the short journeys, stop-start journeys, they're not going to have a problem with it. I, I do think that the, what you have highlighted is that when it comes to villages and the rural areas, there is absolutely no research at all to, help to, back, to back up the decision-making. A lot of research is on the urban areas, but very little in the villages and um, uh, less populated areas. And uh, that's not very helpful, I'm afraid, for you. Just as an engineer, it seems that if, you, if, if you've got a village which is currently 30 miles an hour and it's going to say you're driving through it and there's a mile to go through it or whatever it is at 20 miles an hour, A, you're going to be probably in a lower gear, which means you're revving harder, which is more emissions, and you're doing it for longer, which is a double whammy, it seems to be, that you're actually putting out more emissions from... The, from the, if, you know, I think Rod talked about acceleration and deceleration, that's fair enough, but once you're down to, say, if you come down to 20 miles down from, from something higher rather than 30, drop down into third gear maybe or something must be putting out more emissions. Just an engineer's view, not a... No Did you, was that all your questions? Yeah, that's fine. I'm, uh, okay. I, I recommend that it's supplementary, but I'm fine up to date. Okay. John, I think, Finney, yours, I think, is the next question. Have I got that right? Sorry, Maureen. I'm doing question eight, Camino. Oh, sorry, Maureen. <laughs> sorry. Thank I, you. I double-jumped you and ignored you. I apologise. Maureen, you Morning, panel. Um, I hope we could all agree that we want our citizens to live <coughs> and work, possibly, hopefully, in safe, healthy uh, environments. And I think over the decades, that's not necessarily been the case, that um, our streets have been taken over by the car, and the car has become king. So pedestrians and children playing have had to jump out of the way of cars, rather than cars realise that they should 
give way to um, pedestrians and maybe children playing. So in written evidence that we have seen, we have seen that um, it has been suggested that, if you like, the livability of our neighbourhoods and our streets would increase. And given that we have problems with obesity and active living, surely if we can do something to make our streets more livable in and we, where we feel safe uh, to take more exercise and indeed to let our children out to play and that cars um, are not just going to fly through as happens at the moment, uh, that would be a good thing. I wonder if I could have your views on that. Tony, do you want to start with that on the basis you're driving around Edinburgh at 20 miles an hour, I'm sure, um, and then we'll t go to Neil and Paul. Yeah, I, I think, um, uh, with respect, all of the things that you've said I agree with, and all of them seem to be about the number of cars rather than reducing the speed limit from 30 to 20. So I think if there were less cars on the street and less cars parked, um, that we would... Um, uh, I don't think any, if we all want our children and our grandchildren to breathe cleaner air uh, and to be safe. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure that reducing the speed limit from 30 to 20 miles an hour would reduce the volume of traffic, which I, which I think is more reflected in the points that you made. I think from our perspective, we just think that the, the benefits of 20 mile an hour zones have been oversold as the solution. Um, it has to be clearly only part of the solution. You, if you are going to get people out to play in the streets, and again, an ambition we'd all like to see, healthier people, less traffic, less pollution, be a great thing to have. You, you have to spend some more money on changing the character of the roads. You have to in, invest, in, invest in play streets, you have to change the, the engineering of the road. You have to make it clear to the driver of the car that they are not really meant to be there. And if they understand that, and most drivers will do that, they take their speed uh, driving cues from the environment they're driving through. So they're driving through a, a street that's been uh, relayed, it's got chicanes, it's got planting, it's clearly meant to be a shared space, then they will drive slowly. So I think it, it's, for us, we, our main concern about this whole debate is that it, somehow 20 mile an hour is seen as the answer, and that's it. Um, but it's, it has to be clear, it has to be part of further investment in segregated space and in shared space. And, and actually, if you are, in a car, if you're in a bike and being overtaken by somebody at 20 as opposed to, or say 26 as opposed to 30, you're still being overtaken by a, a tonne and a half of metal very close to you. And that's going to put you off in getting uh, older people and younger people out on, onto, onto bicycles. So it, it has to be more than just 20 mile an hour. And, and, and we're not convinced that you need to start at 20 mile an hour. You, sh you could go straight to that investment and target it. To the, not every street is like that, cars rushing through. These days in particular, most of the accident black spots have been dealt with. Um, so it is, a, it is an issue of trying to invest more in just in making the cityscape look better as a shared space, and then the car drivers will get the message. Very much completely in agreement with uh, my colleague here and uh, with your statement. Uh, uh, the, um, this is, I completely sympathise with the idea that car is king and we need to, we need, that's something we need to do, and this is one element of a series, hopefully, of, of, of policies and interventions that would help tackle that. And again, you know, if we want to really build upon it, then it is about prioritising active travel in, in accordance with the travel hierarchy, and I'm including walking, cycling and bus in that, so it's about you know, giving people the option to walk, giving people the option to cycle and, and, and maintaining bus speeds uh, and making the bus, bus travel attractive. So yes, it is part of a solution, but it's not going to end on on its own, you're going to hope have the impact that we may hope. Maureen, do you want to hear from anyone else? Well, I think everybody should get a chance to give their views on it. OK, Harry. I can say, um, I think it's, it's, uh, your description is, is a perfectly valid one, except that it seems to be the same um, picture, if you like, which, as I said earlier, leads to people feeling to uh, just lower their guard. So, So if you say this is a safer street, and yet it's still got people going through it at 24 miles an hour or something. If kids are playing in there, they shouldn't be playing where the cars are trying... Crossing the road is one thing, but playing in the street is a, is a quite a, a different matter. The street is there for all manner of use, from lorries, taxis, cars, buses and cycles, and people. But it's not one versus the other. Um, yeah, I, I agree that we should be looking to 
um, make the, the streets as safe as possible and uh, in urban areas uh, I have two kids myself and I'm more than happy when they're out playing um, because they're not under my feet apart from anything else um, but uh, it's, it's absolutely important that we create these spaces now my situation is slightly different from some of the other the members of the panel nobody gets in a lorry for any other use other than delivering freight. So they're not doing it for recreation, they're not going to the shops in it or, 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 or any of these things. And, and the amount of vehicles that are on the road, predominantly cars, contribute heavily to congestion, et cetera, and we've touched on that matter. So um, yeah, uh, if we had the infrastructure and the public services that were up to speed to encourage people to use uh, other modes of transport and take up active travel, then th that would make everybody's life a bit better, I think. Richard, you want to come in briefly? Yeah. Some adverts, I've seen the adverts for years on the television, speed kills. Uh, I know of a, a child who was knocked down with someone driving at 20. That child survived. If the person had been driving at 30, that child would have been dead. So do you not agree that speed kills? No. Paul, you were nodding. Uh, it's always dangerous because if you nod, it, it looks like you want to contribute, and I'll bring you in. Having given you a moment to think about your answer now, Paul, do you want to answer? I that? mean, it's a, it would be a straightforward yes. I mean, speed, speed kills. I mean, you could say you could say that in, in the terms of this this um, this bill, is is it bringing speeds down to twenty miles an hour? Um, Maybe not. So so, but I, I completely agree. With speed kills. Has more had, has more. It's been proved. You know, you were asked earlier about evidence. It was proved, it has been proved, that if you reduce the speed of a car, anyone being hit by the car, um, getting hit at 30, you bounce back and you hit your head on the road. If you get hit at 20, you've got more chance. And I know of a specific case where that did happen. And the child now, who was three at that time, would now be about 30. And, and survive. So, would you not agree that 20, the proposal we made by Mr. Ruskell, could possibly save a, a people's lives? Yeah. I honestly don't think it can, and the simple reason is that we've already seen that all the all the surveys and all of the reports so far say the actual mean speed of a drive, of a car in a 20 mile an hour zone is perhaps one mile an hour less than in the 30 mile an hour zone. But, but it's not speed that kills, it's bad driving. If a, a, a driver going at 20 miles an hour half asleep is more likely to hit a child than a driver going at 30 miles an hour who is alert. Um, and there's also a reason not to mix travelling speed with impact speed, because that child assumed if, if, the, if, the, sorry, if the child was hit at 20 miles an hour, do, you know, do we know the, the, the background to what he was doing when he saw the child and, and did he break hard to a point where he hit the child? Do, I mean, I it's, you, you bring the in incident up, do you know more details about it? But it's... My, my question is, is there an example where if you, you could s claim that the, if, it, if the speed limit had been 20 of a child that was killed, <coughs> would that child still survive? Or was it a driver driving dangerously and illegally perhaps more than the speed limit anyway? Well, to answer your question, the person was travelling at 20 miles an hour and the child walked out in front of him on... Uh, from a from a uh, from two cars, cars were parked along the road, and the person uh, the child walked right out in front of the person, so he didn't have time to break. Sure. He actually hit the person at twenty, but the child <laughs> survived. So the driver was driving according to the conditions because he. I mean, I've, there are roads in St Albans where that is the case. That there's cars down each side of the road, even if it's thirty, I would not go at anything more than twenty or fifteen. Sometimes I've actually I don't even like looking at my speedo at that point because I'm too concerned about what's on the side of the road. It's dangerous to try and examine individual cases without having all the information to hand. But I think uh, we'll move on to the next question. Mark, you'd like to come in, I think, on, on particularly on that question, and then we'll move yeah, to John. Yeah, so just a supplementary convener. I was interested in Neil Gregg's views about 20-mile-an-hour zones, because as an, as an organisation, you support 20-mile-an-hour zones outside of schools. But, of course, we know through AA reports that 80% of child accidents don't happen outside of schools. They happen in residential areas. Why don't you support 20 mile hour zones in every residential area where children live? Because we would rather that the resources were targeted at locations where there's a, a real 
quantified problem. We have a limited where, number of resources. Where children aren't being run over. You'd well, rather target the resources there rather than where no, children live if, where they are being If you have a, a street, for example, where there are there's a problem of high speeds and there are children crossing that road and there are, there are injury accidents, the way road safety engineering works is that, unfortunately, you can't quantify a life saved. You have to have to have to have a problem there before you do anything about it. And that may be the wrong way of going about it, but that's the way it works, given the limited resources we have. 20 mile an hour, if, if it's definitely going to work, then it, it should be self-explaining again. It, there should be engineering measures to make it happen. It, it's this blanket approach idea that we that just by putting up some signs, you're actually going to change driver behaviour. And I would, I would have loved for the Atkins report and all these reports to have come back and said quite conclusively, yes, this works, people slow down, there are fewer crashes, there are lower emissions. But unfortunately, that's not so, the answer so we're what, getting from these... So what from proportion these of residential streets in urban areas do you think should be 20? I, I think nearly all residential streets are 20. Anyway. Nearly all residential yeah. streets should be 20, the, the, right? But because automatically they are. They're often dead ends, they're often got Great. car parking, okay. and the vast majority of the local people drive at 20 miles an hour on those roads. Okay. But if, if you're saying that 20 mile an hour is the speed that you want people to be going at, then you, you have to be looking at physical restrictions as well. Because without physical restrictions, as I say, 81% of people driving in 20 mile an hour zones today are breaking the speed limit. So it, it, it's, it's about where you put your resources. And for us, we're just not convinced that these, this blanket approach is actually going to just make any difference. One, and we'd like to make a difference. One fine. You, okay. You've had three questions, okay. in, in fairness. Uh, I, I'd like to move on to John, if I may, because there are a few others here. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, panel, um, with any piece of legislation, were it to be passed, we often are asked about uh, and want to witnesses, witnesses' views on any awareness campaign that would accompany that. So if there were this to pass, uh, first and foremost, do you believe there should be a, an awareness raising campaign and what format should that take, please? Who'd like, uh, Neil, do you want to go on that? I, I would agree 100%. I think the, 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 the biggest disappointment for me out of these studies is the, the lack of awareness of the local people who've had this 20 mile an hour zones, um, well, not inflicted upon them. In many cases, they've asked for it. In actual fact, they, they didn't understand what it was about. They didn't understand what they were supposed to do. Um, uh, so I think your, your awareness campaign isn't necessarily generally about all drivers. I think we can, we can do that at, at a sort of Scottish level through Road Safety Scotland. I think the real key to get the success of these um, zones is actually to raise the awareness of what, the, what you expect the local people to do, because often they don't understand why that uh, zone was put in, they don't understand what they're supposed to do, and then you end up with local people being against a zone, when in actual fact it's there for their benefit. So um, certainly very much a, uh, for an awareness campaign. I, I think it's been a long time since the 20, 30, 40 campaigns that um, uh, Richard Lyle referred to. Uh, we could do with a refresh on that as well, perhaps. But I think for us, it's about consultation and awareness amongst the local people that they're aware these things are not actually working so well. Okay. Is it, John, I mean, does Tony want to come in on that? I, I, I wondered, you know, t taxi drivers making them aware that the speed limit is 20 miles an hour or passenger carrying vehicles. Do you, do you think there should be a campaign and what sort of follow John's question on that. Uh, uh, how do you communicate a message to anybody? That's, that's always problematic. Um, but um, um, I'm, I, I, I would have thought that um, it, it, the simple answer is you change the signage on the street, the drivers all know where to look for speed limit uh, speed limit signs and they should see them. So I'm, I'm not certain how to answer that beyond that, to be honest. Paul, do you want to come in on that? Just that, that, that aspect that I hadn't considered, you know, there's the public awareness and there's also the, the awareness of those who are professional drivers ca carrying passengers and companies will, will obviously feed that into their training and, and, and awareness. The drivers will be aware, the professional drivers and companies will expect them to adhere to that speed limit. Perhaps for the public you could put adverts in the back of buses and then don't know why the viewer confront them is travelling at 20 miles an hour. <coughs> yes, um, so any awareness campaign should aimed at all road users and just to re-emphasise what I've said earlier that it should avoid making the mistake of making vulnerable road users feel too safe leading them to take less care um, and can I ask the panel how likely it is that, they would, uh, that any campaign would increase driver compliance with the reduced speed limit and, and if I may maybe just supplement that by referring to some matters that have been alluded to before the RSC motoring report uh, states that compliance on 30 mile per hour roads is 39%. Uh, 
in 20 mile an hour uh, um, zones, it's 39%. Um, and the Atkins report, which was referred to, it finds that when considering the so-called acceptable speed, that's 10% plus 2 in 20s, is broadly similar to 30s. So in answering that question about the likelihood of com increased compliance with uh, an awareness campaign, can I ask what evidence, other than anecdotal, do you have to counter this claim regarding the level of compliance? Neil. I think you have to be aware that the REC report is a self-reporting study. So you ask someone, do you comply with 30 miles an hour? And of course, they're all going to say yes. The study I'm referring to, and I can share it with the committee. Well, no. yeah, <laughs> well, exactly. But I mean, the, the speed compliance statistics, Great Britain, um, which is out just a few weeks ago. And, and this is me traffic count measurement in the road of actual speeds. And, and it's saying 81% break 20 miles an hour. Uh, that's the total. It, it varies in, in certain. So it, and it underlines the issue. If you ask people, you know, what will you do? Uh, what do I do? They all say, yes, it's great, I will support it. But when, what do they actually do when they go out and drive about? They break the speed limit. So um, it's a difficult one, and it just underlines getting the message over. And that's where it comes back to what I said before about it, the road has to help you. The road has to explain to people why they should be doing that speed. Otherwise, when they have free-flowing conditions, as we see here, you get very high, very low compliance. I, w I wonder, as a general point, and given the organisations represented here, if, if we're all being quite accepting of a situation where we go, well, that's the law, but folk aren't adhering to it. These are alarming statistics, surely, Mr Gregg. Absolutely. And in fact, our, our press release at the time, we, we said that 81% non-compliance, is, it's, it's a terrible thing. You know, that's, that's undermining confidence in speed limits, and undermining confidence in enforcement. Um, the other surveys we've done, people are not keen on enforcement, strong enforcement of 20 mile an hour. They're quite happy to see enforced through physical measures, through awareness campaigns and so on. But if you start talking about speed cameras and police, support fell off quite substantially. So I think you have to be careful about that. But yeah, I, I, that is one of the, again, I have no evidence to, to give you that I can say for, hand on heart that lack of support for complying with would uh, with speed limits is affecting people's behaviour elsewhere and causing more crashes. But certainly we do, uh, we do worry that there's an undermining of confidence in speed limits because of this lack of compliance with some of the speed limits we've got at the moment. Let's just bring Jamie in yeah. and, and give some other... Yeah. Jamie. That. And it, it does follow on nicely from other members' questions. And I think this is the issue around uh, compliance signage, but also driver perception. And c just going to pose a question that's... A, conundrum I've been thinking over of what would be safer in reality is the status quo where a road is a 30 mile, mile per hour limit for its entirety but has signage at appropriate hotspots to designate it as a 20 versus the new world where that road in its entirety is a 20 with no further signage in between to designate reductions or hotspots. Which of those would be a safer environment to be in? Who'd like to go on that? Martin, do you, do you, want to, you looked away. That's also dangerous. <laughs> uh, I should give up poker, I think. <laughs> um, that's a really difficult one because obviously we we're currently in, in the systems that we're in, we, we move from 60 to 40 to 30, you know, or 50 to 30 uh, quite regularly. I, I don't know uh, is, the, is the truthful answer to that. Uh, I would suspect that... Um, keeping uh, the, the same speed limit across the board would be uh, would probably turn out to be the safer, but that's not taken into consideration things like driver frustration. So if you're 20 miles an hour and there isn't another vehicle on the road, then that's going to be difficult to stick to that 20, I would have thought. And Do you want to come in and then I'll bring some other members? Uh, I, St Stuart, go to the contrary. I, 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 would, I would rather that you targeted along a long stretch of road, you targeted the parts where there is an issue and where there's clearly been a problem, and you, that's rather than having just a consistent message, because that doesn't highlight to the driver that there's something there. It says the whole road's safe, and it's not. I'm going to bring Stuart in, and then I'll come to you, Eric. It's really just for Martin. Um, are you familiar with the psychological phenomenon of ennui, which is, uh, in driving, is if you're driving consistently at the same speed all the time, you become desensitized to the speed you're driving at. And there is some research, which is not specific to driving, but to other environments, that it is 
of benefit for there to be periodic variations to reset your attention to what's going on. Are you familiar with that, and do you think that would apply in this context? I, I am, I'll be honest with you. As I said in my, my, my previous statement, I'm, I'm not 100% convinced either way. My suspicions would be along those lines. But uh, as I said, we, we, as an industry, we constantly move uh, from, from varying speed limits. And certainly, as, as Neil points out, when there is uh, a, a drop in speed limit for a specific reason that's clearly uh, outlined and understandable, then, then people will comply to that, or with that, sorry. Eric, I'll bring you in briefly and then move on to the next question. OK, as I said earlier, I think the, the drivers need to be told what the hazard is, what is the reason for... They may, their response will be to drive more slowly if there's a genuine reason that, that, that works. Um, but being told to do a slower speed when there's no apparent change in environment, is a, that's the one where it's going to fail, I think. Um, drivers generally... I mean, like being told there's a sharp bend ahead, but if you're just told to slow down, you think, well, why is that? If you said there's a sharp bend or there's a, a junction coming up on a road, that's much more important to a driver than being told to slow down with no apparent reason. Mike, yours is the next question. Thank you, Convener. Yes, moving on from um, compliance, I want to talk about enforcement. Both are, are linked. And I want to refer to the Scottish Parliament's own information centre briefing, which is available to MSPs and, and everybody else. And on that, it says... Um, quoting some specifics about the Edinburgh, South of Edinburgh research that concluded that when you have a 30 mile, per, mile an hour limit in Edinburgh, uh, the average, most, most drivers were travelling at 22.8 miles an hour. So the vast majority of drivers were obeying the law. When the speed was reduced to 20 miles an hour, the average speed was 20.9 miles an hour. So most drivers are breaking the law and are therefore criminals. This is criminal law we're talking about here. That's applying to most drivers in this study. And the actual speed was reduced by 1.9 miles an hour. Taken with the fact that um, this bill would mean that all repeater signage in the 20 plenty areas have to be taken down. So... Um, I'm not sure everybody's aware of that, but that's that's the case with this bill. All repeating sign, uh, 20 mile an hour, and 20 has to have to be removed. What are the problems? Do you think for enforcement of the criminal law? Who, who'd like to head off on that, uh, Martin? Yeah, uh, very quickly. Um, when you're looking at a situation like this, then uh, the, the policing of it is is vitally important. And again, we know how, through our own dealings uh, with Police Scotland how under-resourced they are, um, then that becomes an issue. We look at the other alternative options, which we were mentioned before, speed cameras, etc., etc., all have a cost attached to them. Uh, and uh, if you were to implement, there would be very little point unless there was a punitive element to it. So the question, again, we, we keep, keep coming back to, and certainly I'm, I'm not going to paraphrase from my colleagues, is would it be better to look at targeted areas which would, which have a greater requirement than other areas and ensure that they are properly policed? Neil, and um, probably bring in Tony and Eric on, on this, so you, we get a cross-section. Going back to a point I made before, when we asked people how would you prefer 20 mile an hour speed limits to be enforced, 45% uh, with, said with signs only, 24% with road humps, speed cameras 14%, by traffic police 4%, none leave it to the drivers to conform 13%. So there is a fall off in support for strong enforcement of 20 mile an hour zones. And I think that that's where it would be very important to see how sensitive the police were to that when they when they did enforce it. At the moment, they've said quite publicly that they don't really enforce 20 mile per hour in, in Edinburgh. Um, the resource issue is a big one, but it's the public support issue. If you started booking people doing 25 miles per hour at three o'clock in the morning on a wide open road with a character the road hasn't changed for years, there's no pedestrians around, uh, you would really risk public support. And I think public support is very important for these sort of uh, measures if they really are going to work. Tony, do, do you want to say anything on that? Yeah. Um, uh, we'd all be safer if there were no cars. Um, <coughs> I, I suppose we're, we're, we're just trying to figure out where the, the practicalities are. Um, if my daughter didn't ride a horse, she wouldn't have fallen off it and broken her collarbone. Um, 
so yeah, I, I understand the arguments about, you know, wouldn't you do less damage hitting something at 20 than you would at 30, of course. Um, however, um, it's, I, I'm beginning to think a wee bit about prohibition as a great example of applying a law that, that, that nobody really adheres to, nobody can really afford, enforce, everybody pretty much ignores and then eventually you reverse the decision. Um, and I think we're talking about looking at the evidence and everything that we've all gathered over the past few years and all of the consultations we've been involved in. Does changing speed limits from 30 to 20 really change the speed of the traffic? No. Does it improve safety? Not that we can evidence. And does it improve emissions? Not that we can evidence. So um, I, I, I've spoken to some of the MSPs individually about, but I know that it doesn't um, uh, change average speeds much, but what it might do is bring down the top end speeds. And that's something I haven't really seen. I, I've heard that argument, but I haven't really seen evidence of that either. But it's possible. But ov over the piece, my, my position is, and the position of our members uh, is that everybody accepts that um, people are likely to pay more attention if you focus on specific areas. Um, and that's more likely to have an influence on people's behaviour than, um, than a very broad brush support, uh, approach where um, enforcement isn't possible, signage disappears, and it's not really in the real world likely to affect anybody's conduct. Eric, do you want to come in briefly and then we'll move on to the next question? Uh, without wishing to put words in Mike's mouth, it sounded like an argument not to roll out this at all, uh, because what you said is that there's a very small change in actual speeds. They're already over 20 at just, and they're still just over 20. Um, as Tony, I think, said, um, no change to emissions. Um, so I, I, I do wonder what the benefit is of this. You, you say criminalise. In fact, though, having said that, the average speed before was 22.8, and if you apply normal, somebody said 20%, uh, sorry, 10% plus two miles an hour, um, you wouldn't be prosecuted anybody at 22.8, the previous speed in those areas, let alone what it's come down to 20.9 in after the 20 mile an hour is put in. So yeah. it's a, a curious argument, I think, if you're trying to support 20. Briefly. Well, nobody's commented uh, throughout the whole of this session about my comment that um, this law, if we pass this law as it's suggested in this bill, all the repeater signs for 20s plenties have to be removed. You cannot have repeater signs uh, in the 20 plenty zone. So there'll only be one sign in the zone that comes in. And do you think, therefore, this will have effect on compliance and enforcement? Uh, and, and the point I'm trying to make is, as, taken by Tony's comment about prohibition, that, in fact, when we produce laws of the land, we should produce laws of the land that have public support, and that uh, if, you, if you don't produce laws of the land that have public support, then you undermine it, and uh, therefore, do you think that this will happen in this case? Who'd like Eric? And I just agree. Neil. Yeah, it will happen, I'm sure. People need to know what the, the, uh, the speed is. Yeah, I think that is a fear. Uh, and it, the compliance figures I've been quoting to you suggest that already it is an issue. We don't have 30 mile an hour repeater signs at the moment, and people claim they don't know what the speed limit is and break the speed limit. One, one quick thing going back to awareness campaigns and enforcement there could be an opportunity here to have a 20 mile an hour speed awareness uh, course type approach. So rather than issuing tickets and penalties and fines, you actually get people in and get this message over to them. Because if, if, if people feel that they don't understand what's going on, what, don't understand why the 20 is there, then getting them in and putting them in a room um, with speed awareness courses work for other speed limits. There is a, speed, a 20 mile an hour speed awareness course being developed south of the border. If we do get speed awareness courses up here, then it could, that could be a potential opportunity to re-educate people and, and raise awareness. OK, I think we'll move on to the next question. John, that's you. Uh, thanks very much, Convener. Um, I, I mean, we, I realise we're going over the same ground from different angles. My angle being uh, from a financial memorandum, and we're talking about a cost here of some £20 million. Pounds, and I'm wondering, uh, seems to be my role in the committee, I think, uh, whether this is the best thing we can do with £20 million. Pounds. So, I mean, for example, one thought I have is why, if, if we're going to have to have a, only restricted roads, so the cities will be full of main roads which are still at 30, but all the side roads will be 20. So um, that means that you're going along 
a major road at 30, you turn, there's going to be a sign that says 20, you get to the end of the minor road, it says 30 again. There's going to be a big cost for the councils. From, so from a cost point of view, wouldn't it be better just to make the whole of Glasgow 20? And that, I think that would be cheaper for the council. So I would be interested in your views on that. But actually also from a safety point of view, because if the kid does not know if they're on a side road, oh, the traffic's only going at 20, I can be more relaxed. Uh, once I go around the corner into the main road, it's going to be 30. So wouldn't it be both cheaper and safer if we just made it small town, big city, all 20? Who'd like to go on that? N Neil? In the overall scheme of things, when it comes to roads, 20 million isn't a lot of money. Uh, it doesn't buy you, you know, a new dual carriage or anything of that nature. But certainly, given the cash strap nature of most local authorities these days, the state of the roads, you could certainly spend 20 million better on things like potholes and actual things like cycle rates, cycle lanes, segregated facilities, targeting the areas where the, you have the biggest road safety problems. I think that for us, it's, it's all about the impact on road safety. And you know, we're just not convinced that this is going to have a huge impact on road safety. And if it takes the resources away from elsewhere, then it could have a, a negative effect in other parts of, of, of council spending. But I think I made the, I made the point before, uh, it is just the cumulative effect on councils of all these things that are happening is going to be the main issue. And that, that's what I'm hearing. But I, I have no further information on the actual financial implications for individual councils. But certainly, if they're being asked to do lots of these different things, then you know something has to, to, to come off the end of the, of, the, of the line and be missed off. And you seem to be saying that it would be... You feel it would be cheaper for councils if we just made the whole of an area. Clear, clearly, 20. if you if you streamline the process and make the process cheap, that would be cheaper for councils. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is, if, if, you, if the overall cost you mentioned was 20 million pounds, that still could be better spent elsewhere in terms of an impact on road safety. In our view. Okay, Paul, Paul, do you want to come in on that? In this scenario, would we still be allowed to apply for a TRO for key bus arterial routes? That would be my. My ask of that, if it's 20 miles an hour blanket, can we still have the discussion about where there is the potential for exemptions, where you can maybe say that a, a, a bus is stuck in, in traffic and congestion and there may be a small stretch where they feel that they, there's the chance to make up some of that lost time and, it, and if it's acceptable and if it's not acceptable, what kind of measures could be put in place to uh, allow that bus, f you know, free flow, uh, um, aside from the congestion, what sort of bus priority measures. So that kind of discussion we would like to see take place at a local authority um, in your scenario or in the current scenario with restricted roads. Broadly, that is what we're all agreeing, that yeah. there will be exceptions whichever way yeah. you do it. So I, th I think just, uh, do you have a preference then or are you willing to just work with whatever the system is between, you know, blanket 20 with some exceptions or some 20s, some 30s and still some exceptions or... I do not have a preference. You don't have a preference. Sorry, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. To see one way or the other. Mike, you wanted to come in. Uh, a question particularly for Paul, I think. Um, looking at the financial memorandum, following on from what John has just been saying, in the financial me uh, memorandum it says councils will have pay about £10 million over two years for all the signage. But what the act bill actually says is that, uh, I'm thinking of rural Scotland in particular, in my area of Aberdeenshire, um, all the A and B roads are not affected. So all the, village, all the roads through the villages are not going to be reduced by this bill. So, but every single road and lane where there is street lighting in every village across Scotland is going to have to have, by this law, signage in and out of every lane and road throughout the land. Do you think 9 to £10 million pounds over a two-year period is going to do that? Not qualified to, to, to for the, for the cost of that. I know that um, one of the things that I, I was pleased about the financial memorandum is that it's signage that we're talking about and not traffic calming measures such as speed bumps, because that is something that our members would would, would find would add to their costs and it increases maintenance costs and makes the the ride less pleasant. But um, I can't comment on the cost of the signage if that's going to be enough. Okay, maybe we'll move on to the next question, which is Colin. Colin. Thanks very much, Kevin. I think most of the points have been raised, and I think it's clear that the, um, the panel are, are probably sceptics on, on the bill itself. But, but can I come back on a point that Eric made, who seems to be implying that it's actually going to make things worse? And in fact, the Alliance's own evidence um, states, and I quote, 
vulnerable road users are given the perception that 20 mile an hour zones are safer than 30 mile an hour areas and behave less cautiously. What evidence does the Alliance have to, to back this claim up? And why do you think it's appropriate to blame vulnerable road users for the fact that they get run over by cars going too fast? I'm not sure I blame them, but I, 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 I'm not speaking for the ABD now. I don't know what evidence they've got, but I just know that every time I drive through a 20 mile an hour zone, I behave with the 20 mile an hour limit. But I see people wandering into the road, um, not using the Pelican crossings, not waiting for them to go red, uh, looking at their mobile phones with their earpieces on, headphones or whatever. Um, it must be the same. In fact, I'm sure it's been true up here. I haven't been, only arrived last night in Edinburgh. But it's just a natural thing that, that generally people are encouraged to feel safer. And in fact, a lot of the public opinion surveys that 2020 do is, do you feel safer? If you feel safer, it's a natural human instinct to lower your guard. Why wouldn't you? But you don't have any, any evidence at all to back that up. That's, that's what happens. People are, more people are run over in 20 mile hour zones because they feel safer. Is that any evidence out there that, should, that backs well, that claim up? The, the evidence that, that something is happening in 20 mile an hour zones comes from Manchester, for example, where they've found that the accidents in 20 mile an hour zones did not go down as much, according to sort of uh, trend, as areas which are still 30. And other, um, other areas will, will say something different, but you're saying that in Manchester, therefore, those figures are based on vulnerable road users, in, in, in the words of the Alliance, behaving in an irresponsible way, basically? Perhaps the word vulnerable is wrong. It's just road users generally, um, pedestrians particularly, uh, maybe young people. I don't know. It's, it's, they, they seem to be the ones with the headphones on and looking at their phones most of the time. Um, but but you, can't, you can't specify any studies or anything that, that backs up the claim that in 20 mile zones that problem's worse? I mean, people wear headphones in 30 mile hour zones as well. I mean, but you're saying there's a particular problem with 20 mile They have zone. not been encouraged to think that, that 30 mile an hour is safe, or 40, or 50. 20, it's a very much a 20s plenty theme. Um, you know, go and play in the street, it's safe. In fact, John earlier mentioned a kid needs to know what the speed limit is. Kids don't know what the speed limit is. They know what the flavour of a road is. They'll know whether they need, they should do, know whether they need to be careful to cross a road because it's a fairly busy road. They should know how to use a Pelican crossing. Um, if it's a 20 mile an hour limit, they should not be encouraged to just wander into the road and kick the ball around. Uh, that can only lead to... Bring in Gail briefly and then move on to John. Yeah, I wonder therefore if it's an educational issue because surely we should be teaching our children not to walk into a road without looking regardless of what the speed limit is. Absolutely. And if they're doing that, then we need to reevaluate what we're actually teaching our children. And so if it goes hand in hand with enforcement, awareness raising and education, then surely that's a, a whole package that we should be putting together. Which is what I said earlier, it's important that the, that the rollout, if there's a rollout campaign, it's not telling people it could be lovely and safe and go and play in the road. That's, that's what's going on at the moment, though. That's Rod King's approach. John, do you want to follow up? Yes, uh, I mean, to build on what Colin just asked, <clears throat> I mean, I've, I've got a busy junction in my constituency right next to my office called Parkhead Cross. Some of you may have seen it. Um, now, already, a number of my constituents, and I have to say this is in a poorer area, of my constituency, so it's probably one of the poorest areas of the country. But a lot of people are just totally relaxed at the moment. And I see parents dragging their kids across the road. It's a busy, busy junction against the red lights. I see vulnerable people. I see people at night when the roads are quieter, but you just get say, one drunk person and he wanders across the road in his dark clothing. Nobody's going to see him. So, I mean, surely someone like that is going to be safer if that whole junction was reduced to 20. And as the Glasgow Centre for Population Health, the Faculty of Public Health and the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health have said, if when they do get hit, because I'm afraid that has always happened and probably will, but being hit at 20 at that junction is going to be a lot less bad than being hit at 30 at that junction. Do you want to go on that? So, so your argument there, I think, is you've, you're now being hit by a, a law-abiding driver who has said it's a 20 mile an hour limit, speed limit or a 30, whatever. He's, he's lo abiding by the law and he's driving carefully and, yeah, he's either seen it or he hasn't seen the person in the dark clothing lying on the road because he's drunk. It, more, it's, it's just as likely that somebody who is not law-abiding, who's perhaps thinking it's late at night, I can do 40 now because it's a 30 limit, or maybe I can do 40 because it's a 20 mile an hour limit. <laughs> I don't think, I think the likelihood of a collision being avoided because a, a law-abiding driver has reduced their speed to the speed limit is 
th that's a very unlikely scenario. I think I mentioned that in my paper. Um, I mean, most road accidents. I mean, I, I don't really see your distinction between what, who's law abiding and who's not. Okay. I mean, if if the, the point is, if somebody gets hit, whether the person, you know, whatever speed they're doing, if they're doing a lower speed, they're less likely to get killed. They're less likely to be uh, hurt. And you know, even if the person behind is not law abiding, well, if the car in front of them is law abiding, then they're both going to be going slower, aren't they? So my counter to that is, find me an accident where somebody has been killed or injured or whatever it is where you could plausibly claim that had the speed limit been lower, and 20 is the obvious one in this example, that that would not have happened. There are, please do, because I've been asking for that sort of thing for a long okay, time. Okay, well, we're not here to, yeah, okay, yes. I mean, we take your points you're making, we're not going to give you no. answers immediately, but um, you're not, you, you, because, Sorry, just going to say that, because, if an accident is caused by a drunk driver or a, an illegal driver, whatever, you know, a stolen car or whatever, that is not going to be affected by a different speed limit. That driver will drive badly, whatever the speed limit is. That's what I'm arguing. Which is an argument against any speed limit at all. It may be. Right. I mean, I believe that most people could drive safely with, with, with no safe, speed limits. With right. Okay. Let's I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the panel? OK, I think we've reached the end of that evidence session. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming in. I'm briefly going to suspend the meeting to allow the witnesses to depart, so the meeting is suspended. I'd like to reconvene the meeting now and to move on to agenda item four, which is subordinate legislation. This is, uh, there is one item for consideration, which is one negative instrument on zoo technical standards. The instrument ensures that the system of zoo technical standards functions effectively in Scotland. No motions to annul have been received in relation to the instrument. And uh, I want to know if anyone wants to raise any points. If somebody wants to raise a point, I am going to make a declaration that I have a farming interest uh, and I'm part of a farming partnership that breeds pedigree cattle, but I don't propose to make any comment on this. Uh, Stuart. Uh, my apologies for not prior notification. I just noticed. Um, I, I'm content to support this. I'd just like to write to the government and ask them uh, at section 54C what they mean by other public holiday. Because what it looks like, bluntly, 
is that what's been lifted and put in this Scottish piece of legislation looks awfully like something that's lifted out of an English piece of legislation and other public <coughs> holiday in Scotland means something different because public holidays vary by locality. Okay. And I just want to be clear what they intend. Okay. Does anyone else have a comment? So is the committee agreed it doesn't want to make any recommendation in relation to the instrument except to ask the government to clarify the definition of public or any other, other, public, public. other public holiday? Agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. That concludes the, the part of the meeting that is in public. We're now moving to private.